Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Jardin Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Les années passent Qu'il est loin, là je tombe Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte Well, there's a thing happening in Washington right now. Mitch McConnell is now on the floor of the Senate defending himself against what he just called modern-day McCarthyism after some pundits described him as un-American and some as a Russian asset. Some have been calling him uh, uh, Moscow Mitch. Here's the reason and here's the context. Last week, Mueller came... No, no, not yet. Not doing it yet. Last week, Mueller, uh, Robert Mueller, testified, and just as his report had said, the Russians interfered with the election in an attempt to get Donald Trump elected president, that everyone's aware of it, that there needs to be... That, that right now, he believes it's one of the greatest threats to our democracy. The next day, two standalone bills were brought up, to try to protect against Russian interference in the 2020 election, and Mitch McConnell blocked them. The day after Mueller said it's underway, he stopped a bill that's goal was to protect the United States from the Russian invasion in cyber world into our, into our elections. So now he's defending himself, and it happened during the commercials, so we kind of paused it like you would a DVR, and we're backing it up to a relevant point, so let's listen in my career or knows anything about Congress. Even the New York Times editorial board noted over the weekend that while they certainly don't agree with all my views, they are principles going back decades. And the Times had to admit the Democrats are, quote, playing politics, end quote, by introducing legislation with, listen to this, no chance of passing the Senate that serves only to harden, harden partisan divisions. That's the New York Times this weekend. So, Mr. President, my differences with Democrats on complicated matters of election law are the kind of disagreements we used to be able to have without mainstream media outlets screaming that one side is traitorous. This Congress, this entire country, only works when we refuse to let baseless smears displace real debate. Benjamin Franklin said we have this republic if we can keep it. And among, th and among other things, keeping our republic means we can't let modern day McCarthyism win. So here's my commitment. No matter how much they lie, no matter how much they bully, I will not be intimidated. For decades, I abused my Senate seat to stand up to Russia and protect the United States of America. I'm proud of my record. I'm proud that it's right there in black and white. And liars cannot gaslight it away. In the 1980s, as a freshman senator, I proudly stood with President Reagan on missile defense and other aspects of his Soviet policy. While the liberal media was shrieking, shrieking, that Reagan-Bush foreign policy wouldn't work. I was honored to support it with my vote and then watch communism crumble. Then in the 1990s, I used my place on the state foreign ops subcommittee to sound the alarm when President Clinton was too soft on Russia. Here's the Wall Street Journal, December 1994. Kentucky Senator handed keys to foreign aid to be the most potent foe of Clinton's Russia policy. Here's what that article said. 
The real challenge to the administration's policy is McConnell's plan to attach, to attach stiff political conditions to that aid, threatening a cutoff unless Russia stops meddling in its neighbors' affairs. So let me say that again. As early as the 1990s, I was on record as laser-focused on Russia's meddling beyond its borders and making sure the Russians were held accountable. And Mr. President, I ask consent this article be placed in the record. Without objection. On the other end of the Clinton administration, I used hearings to grill Democratic officials who were soft on President Yeltsin and optimistic about President-elect Putin. I didn't share Democrats' faith that Putin would be our friend. I ask consent that two excerpts of my committee statement from April 4, 2000, calling for a tougher stance on Russia's foreign meddling and expressing skepticism about Vladimir Putin, appear at this point. Without objection. And of course, I helped lead the charge against the Obama administration's completely feckless Russia policies. President Obama mocked his 2012 opponent for taking Russia too seriously. His administration sought a naive reset with the Kremlin. And for eight years, I helped lead the charge against that weakness. In 2010, I stood with John McCain and John Kyle to oppose the New START Treaty, a watered-down placeholder for the sort of tough stance we knew was necessary. As Vladimir Putin was building up his missile arsenal, we even had to push President Obama to commit to deploying capable missile defenses to Europe. In 2012, I firmly supported sweeping legislation to authorize heavy sanctions following the killing of Sergei Magnitsky in a Russian prison. The Obama administration flinched and tried to tiptoe around our legislation to avoid messing up their charm offensive, but we backed them into a corner and the president signed the bill into law. In 2014, I and other Republicans constantly pressed President Obama to get tougher on Russia with respect to Putin's aggression in Ukraine. So, Mr. President, I ask consent that the news article dated March 4, 2014, entitled McCon McConnell, Obama's Passive Foreign Policy is a Mistake, appear in the record. Without objection. And since 2017, I've continued reminding everyone that Putin is not our friend, that Russia is going to continue trying to meddle, that we need a comprehensive strategy to contest Russian aggression, that alliances like NATO are critical for standing up to our adversaries. So once more, for good measure, Mr. President, I ask consent that the news article dated August 15, 2018, entitled U.S. Senate Top Republican Likens Russia to Old Soviet Union, be included in the record. Without objection. So, Mr. President, I don't normally take the time to respond to critics in the media when they have no clue what they're talking about. But this modern-day McCarthyism is toxic and damaging because of the way it warps our entire public discourse. Facts matter. Details matter. History matters. And if our nation is losing its ability to debate public policy without screaming about treason, that really matters. In the middle of the 20th century, the original McCarthyism hurt America's strength and diminished our standing in the Cold War by dividing us against ourselves and letting lies, innuendo, and baseless accusations The facts do matter, out. and that's what's happening again now. The Russians are using cyber influence to divide us amongst ourselves. They attacked our election. It is the consensus of the intelligence community that they are attacking our election now. There's not been one standalone alone bill in his chamber, the chamber which he leads, to try to stop it. There have not been congressional hearings to bring the nation together around the common cause that is the Russians are attacking us and we must make it stop. Democracy is at stake. That has not happened. Not yet. Not at all. It is Tuesday. The 30th of July of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. That's right, a little scant dash of hot smoked Hungarian paprika. 
makes all the difference in the world. It really, really, and truly does. Well, a lot of pushback on this latest mass shooting, this time in Gilroy, California, at the Garlic Festival of all places. Uh, of course, I've got the usual pushback from the Trump bro gun nuts. And also, you know, a few liberal people who aren't quite ready to admit that uh, maybe white supremacist, white supremacist terrorism might be a problem here in these United States. Um, but <laughs> let me just make this clear. Whenever you hear of a mass killer shooting a bunch of people and immediately you start seeing that uh, the mental health of the suspect is brought into question, uh, you can assume one thing, the fucker be white. And yes, I do have a trademark uh, application pending for that term, the fucker be white. And every time you start hearing about mental health being swept under the rug and never talked about, it's talked about every single time a mass shooter is white. Every single time. It's become a joke. <laughs> it is. So uh, I got that going for me, which is nice. Yes, on Facebook. That Facebook is where the right wing loves to uh, live and really loud, uh, loudly, too. <laughs> they live loud in your face. Uh, doesn't matter what kind of facts. Facts don't matter. They truly don't. Uh, was taken to task that, uh, you know, the the Nevada gun laws are a lot more robust than we liberal snowflakes admit. Yeah, well, look them up. I actually posted a summary of the robust Nevada gun laws. Uh don't, don't need an ID to even get one. <clears throat> even though I was told by apparently Nevada residents that you need an ID. Well, apparently not, not according to the law. And even if the law was on the books, there are gun sanctuary cities where they don't follow any of those laws. And that is part of the law, too. I mean, Nevada gun laws, too. The gun sanctuary cities are able to, yeah, avoid upholding the law. Okay, that's local control for you. And this kid, uh, living in California, Nevada resident, gets his guns in Nevada because there's no restrictions on ammo, amount capacity, uh, no restrictions on the kind of weapon that you can purchase. The gun shop that he picked up his weapon, because he purchased it online, but he had to go pick it up. The gun owner did the, you know, the background check. And, you know, he, he said, the gun owner, you know, he said, look, we're really, really sorry. We would never sell a gun to somebody who just doesn't look right. He looked happy, the gun owner said. Gun shop owner said he looked happy. Yeah, I think he was really happy about getting this gun and as many uh, bullets as he could carry, apparently. And he got to be able to kill a bunch of people. That made him very happy. Now, it didn't. But there was nothing untoward about his appearance. And I keep thinking what that might be. Especially when the owner said, we wouldn't sell a gun to the wrong looking kind of person. Huh. Could it be the pigment of a person's epidermis, possibly? <laughs> There's no color in the epidermis. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Would the darker you might cause you to think, well... This person might be up to no good. The kid looked happy buying a gun with all the bullets he could carry. Apparently that keeps uh, the lawsuits of liability being thrown at that gun shop owner, at least in Nevada. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, though there be... 
shellfish in this chowder. Oh, you didn't know? Well, there is. There's also corn in it, roasted corn. Very, very good. You'll, you'll, you'll see. It's great. Well, of course, at the top, that was Fox News anchor Shep Smith, and he was not having any of Moscow Mitch McConnell's whining about a modern-day McCarthyism. Yeah. You know, the difference between when they go after you for having supposed commie connections is that they make it up. When we're on a rat hunt, and what's a rat hunt? It's a spy hunt. It's because there's there's credible evidence, if not actual uh, uh, doings, that uh, that cause us to us we being you know the Democrats I suppose <laughs> so much so much for the idea of bipartisanship on the law especially national security securing the United States is apparently a political ploy by the Democrats just to win at the ballot box can't have that. So Mitch McConnell says he is not Moscow Mitch, and he gave some evidence to prove it. Well, Mitch, (laughs) you blamed Obama? Actually, he lied about what Obama did or didn't do. Mitch McConnell and his group were the ones who threw up the roadblocks every time Obama wanted to stand up to Vlad, to the point that Obama had to go right up to Vlad into his face physically at a G20 meeting. And stare that little mofo down. Because we couldn't get the Republicans to get on board. Because the black guy wanted it. Let's not forget. On the rest of the menu, speaking of Trump and his 2016 campaign, well, they gave a draft of that America First speech to a foreign government for approval first. Trump retweeted a racist British columnist who called Baltimore a proper asshole. And a new bombshell report out of Elijah Cummings' oversight committee detailing the hidden effort by Trump allies to empower Saudi Arabia's nuclear ambitions may explain the raft of racist vitriol directed at the committee chair. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Capital One says what information you and over 100 million other individuals in the U.S. and Canada have in your wallet. It's been hacked. And Brazil's Bolsonaro said there is no evidence. An indigenous leader was murdered by illegal miners who invaded protected tribal lands and threatened tribal communities with murder. For the last several months, no evidence. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the right ish of the page, right there by the social media scroll, appropriately placed, I might add, is our chat room link. And Kelly Lincoln monitors that. Thank you, Kelly, for taking on that task. To the left ish of the page at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will then notice our link to our Patreon site. And all kidding aside, if you could please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it doesn't take much, you know, five, ten dollars, whatever. Uh, the cost of an espresso type coffee drink, uh, directed our way once a month goes a long way for us to be able to pay our bills, accumulate those funds that we're still accumulating to buy some, uh, newish equipment. These workhorses are still workhorses, but you know what happens to workhorses. They wear out. So sad. 
Well, we've been uh, putting these workhorses through their paces for over the last four years because we have been broadcasting at Netroots Radio for over the last eight years. Continuous 24-7, 365 broadcasting. The hardest working network on the web. I might, I, I, I think that might be a true-ism. Truly. So uh, we would be unable to do this without you. And your generosity allows us to keep resisting as resistance radio uh, was intended originally. Original intention by the founders. And I'm not talking about eight years ago. I'm talking about way back, way back. The founding of the nation. Yeah. Your generosity allows us to do our civic duty. And we are forever grateful. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so easy. Just go to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we are forever grateful that he does that as well. I take care of at Justice Putnam, and I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime, and then I get that link out on social media for you. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. Pick up podcasts. By way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and you know, wherever fine podcasts can be found. And our our podcast will be right next to those fine ones because we're there with every single podcast in the world. Okay, a little bit of station news for you. Uh, Randy Rhodes has uh, changed her schedule because she is now on Free Speech TV as well. And you can listen to... Randy here on Netroots Radio, as you have been uh, while you work, because sometimes, you know, the TV is a little bit too much and, uh, you know, you can only put so much on your screen, your desktop. So we're here to clear up your desktop and free you up to do the work that maybe you need to do. So uh, uh, because of that schedule change, uh, we are tweaking the schedule and it has changed somewhat. And there's a little bit of tweaking left to do. And I'm speaking with some other content providers and uh, we'll keep you informed. But do check the schedule because it has changed ever so slightly or majorly, depending on your point of view. All right. Let's get into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. It is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, just so you know. Oliver Willis of Share Blue Media brings us this offering. Documents released by the House Oversight Committee yesterday, Monday, reveal that the Trump campaign submitted a speech to a foreign government for approval and additions. The subject of the speech was America First. Emails and texts uncovered by the committee show that investor and Trump advisor Thomas Barrick provided an advanced copy of Trump's planned speech to an associate in the United Arab Emirates, otherwise known as the UAE. The associate then told Barrick he shared them with the UAE and Saudi government officials. Ho, ho, ho. After which Barrick arranged for language requested by the UAE officials to be added to the speech with the help of Trump's campaign manager at the time. Yeah, that's right. The jailed Paul Manafort. Manafort later emailed Barrick to let him know that the campaign had done the UAE's bidding. Manafort is among the more prominent members of Trump's inner circle, now in prison. Trump's speech was delivered in North Dakota in May of 2016. He said in the speech he was embracing an America First energy plan and that we will accomplish complete American energy independence. He did not tell his fervent supporters that the speech they were applauding went through the UAE's hands first. I kept telling everybody, the America First speech is not a speech about making America great. Yeah, it sounded like, oh, we're going to be all fattened up and be sa fat and sassy and happy. I told everybody, it's not a Bible for America. It's a cookbook.
Melanie Schmidt of Think Progress brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Trump retweeted a racist British columnist who tweeted that the city of Baltimore was a proper she-hole. Katie Hopkins, who is anti-Muslim, anti-multiculturalism, and has pushed the white genocide conspiracy theory, which claims that immigration is promoted solely as a means of wiping out the white race, tweeted a video earlier Sunday morning from the Baltimore Field Division of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, affectionately known as the ATF. The video footage from July 24 showed three people knocking down, kicking, and hitting another person in the middle of a street in East Baltimore. According to ATF, the individual being assaulted was a civilian employee of the Baltimore police. Well, so she tweeted about how how much crime is being perpetrated by those people in Baltimore. So, Trump later retweeted Hopkins' tweet from his personal account. Well, how nice. The language in Hopkins' tweet was reminiscent of the Trump's comments last year when he said immigrants from Haiti, El Salvador, and several African countries were from shithole countries. We are having all these people from shithole countries come here, he said. Why do we need more Haitians? Take them out. Trump suggested instead that lawmakers focus on bringing in immigrants from places like Norway. Well, he just said Norway because he really meant, how about from Gorky Park? There's a lot of money in Gorky Park, and they're spending it here. Hopkins uh, was alluding to several racist comments Trump made over the weekend, in which he called Elijah Cummings' home district, which includes a majority black West Baltimore, a disgusting rat and rodent-infested mess. Well, that's because Mar-a-Lago is. Really, too. Don't eat at Mar-a-Lago. In fact, don't eat at any Trump-owned hotel. Every single one has massive health code violations. It's It's weird. Well, Trump tried to defend his recent comments once more, tweeting there is nothing racist and stating plainly what most people already know, that Elijah Cummings has done a terrible job for the people of his district and Baltimore itself. Dems always play the race card when they are unable to win with facts. Shame. I really love it when racists call people calling out racism racist. Now, remember, you're either a racist or you're anti-racist. There is no such thing as not being racist. Internet brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terry Townshouter Tuesday's House Oversight Committee uh, Chair Elijah Cummings released a new report yesterday, Monday, detailing a hidden effort by top allies of Trump to empower Saudi Arabia to pursue its nuclear ambitions without the typical safeguards. The stunning report may help explain why. In recent days, Trump has been furiously smearing Cummings with racist attacks. Today's report reveals new and extensive evidence that corroborates committee whistleblowers and exposes how corporate and foreign interests are using their unique access 
to advocate for the transfer of U.S. nuke technology to Saudi Arabia, Cummings said in a statement. The American people deserve to know the facts about whether the White House is willing to place the potential profits of the president's personal friends above the national security of the American people and the universal objective of preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. Well, the committee found that Tom Barrack, the f- fundraiser uh, mentioned in the in the uh, earlier story here, uh, offering in the Bistro Cafe, All the while, he was talking with Trump about potentially joining the administration. Well, both he and the inaugural committee are reportedly under federal investigation for involvement in illegal foreign lobbying. The report also found that IP3, a private nuclear technology company, was pushing the administration to allow Saudi Arabia to use materials without safeguards to prevent their configuration as nuke weapons. We're going to go to war with Iran because they are generating electricity with nuke power. But we're going to sell the Sauds actual components to make explosive devices, weapons of mass destruction. Jim Jordan, the ranking member on the committee, tried to downplay the findings, saying in a statement that the evidence before the committee to date does not show that the Trump administration acted inappropriately in the proposed transfer of nuke energy technology to Saudi Arabia. Well, the majority of the committee saw things differently. Mitch McConnell, Moscow Mitch, this is not modern-day McCarthyism. It's a little bit like the Rosenbergs giving nuke technology to the Reskies. Scary, isn't it? Very. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we are going to go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, move over, Jaws. The premise of Crawl may not be that original, but it's nonetheless effective when it comes to generating some genuine thrills and chills. Set in the midst of a Florida hurricane, Crawl centers on a college swimmer, Haley, played by British actress Kaya Scodelario. Against the warnings of everyone, she decides to check in with her father, Dave, who she can't reach, and who seems to have ignored the calls for a mandatory evacuation. After a harrowing trip through the storm, she finds him in the basement of the family home. Unfortunately, however, Dave is isn't the only thing trapped in the flooded basement. A group of agitated alligators, escapees from a nearby gator farm, have also decided to make the basement their new home, and Haley must try to rescue her injured dad and herself from both the gators and the rapidly rising waters. Set mainly in this basement, Crawl has a dark and claustrophobic feel to it, which is nearly as scary as the man-eating reptiles. In fact, the basement becomes almost a third main character in the film, and director Alexander Aja makes the most of it. Also, unlike some other killer gator films, these beasts look like the real deal, thanks largely to advanced CGI and some really good models. Still, it's the actors who make the movie work. Scodelario comes across as a tough warrior, while Barry Pepper's Dave plays a dad who, despite experiencing his share of personal disappointments, still has enough life force in him to want to survive and keep his daughter safe. While predictable, Crawl is never boring and brings off jump tricks with the best of them. Comparisons to Jaws, which the director has admitted was an inspiration, are inevitable. But Crawl, with its disciplined, minimalist approach, manages to shine on its own. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube.
Hi, I'm Scientific American Podcast Editor Steve Mursky, and here's a short piece from the July 2019 issue of the magazine in the section called Advances, Dispatches from the Frontiers of Science, Technology, and Medicine. The article is titled Quick Hits, and it's a rundown of some science and technology stories from around the globe, compiled by editorial contributor Jim Daly. From Guatemala, archaeologists unearthed the largest known Mayan figurine factory, the more than 1,000-year-old workshop mass-produced intricate statues that were likely used in diplomacy as gifts to allies. From Nepal, researchers confirmed the nation's first recorded tornado, which occurred during a devastating storm in March. The team relied on satellite imagery and posts on social media to make the identification. From Antarctica, Emperor penguins have abandoned one of their biggest breeding colonies, possibly because of sea ice loss. Biologists found that the population, which reached about 25,000 breeding pairs of birds in 2010, collapsed in 2016 and has not rebounded since. From China, the large high-altitude air shower observatory on the eastern edge of the Tibetan Plateau began operating in April. Located some 4,400 meters above sea level, the observatory will study high-energy cosmic rays. From Australia, the government announced it will not regulate gene editing technology, provided it does not introduce new genetic material to target sites in the genome. Editing human embryos used for reproduction is still banned. And from Kenya... Paleontologists have identified a fossil jawbone in the Nairobi National Museum that came from a previously unknown giant carnivore which roamed Africa 22 million years ago. The predator was likely larger than a polar bear and had fangs the size of bananas. That was Quick Hits by Jim Daly. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com. All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondrous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. If you leave a child in a car on a hot day with the windows rolled up, I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. You've created a situation that could be lethal and certainly poses a serious risk of injury, which, as David Fauti, the director of the ACLU's National Prison Project, points out, is exactly what we're doing to prisoners across the United States, particularly in the South, with temperatures far in excess of 100 degrees and with prisons that are usually built out of heat-retaining materials. These prisons put at serious risk inmates who are taking psychotropic drugs or meds for high blood pressure or who have asthma or who are 55 or older. As a recent report on the stultifying summer heat in prisons recently released by the East Hampton, Massachusetts-based Prison Policy Initiative says, quote, courts in Wisconsin, Arizona, and Mississippi have ruled that incarceration in extreme hot or cold temperatures violates the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. But these court cases have not had a national impact on air conditioning in prisons. And many prisons, even those recently built, intentionally have none. 
with the result that incarcerated people are being subjected to conditions that violate basic human rights, with we on the outside being responsible for closing any windows and letting medically vulnerable human beings bake. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1975. That was the day that began one of the greatest mysteries of the United States labor movement. Teamster president Jimmy Hoffa disappeared in Detroit. Hoffa was the son of a coal miner. After his father died, Jimmy left school and went to Detroit to work in a warehouse. When Hoffa was only 20 years old, he organized a strike of dock workers at the Kroger Grocery and Bakery Company. He became recognized for his labor organizing skills and went on to head the Teamsters Union. Under Hoffa's leadership, the Teamsters had become the largest international labor union. He played a key role in negotiating the first ever National Freight Hauling Agreement. In 1967, he faced several charges related to a federal investigation. He was convicted of jury tampering and sentenced to 10 years in prison. President Richard Nixon commuted Hoffa's sentence in 1971, but the release was conditional upon his not participating in union activities for 10 years. Hoffa planned to appeal this restriction in court. What happened next is a mystery. He was reportedly scheduled to have a dinner meeting with Anthony Tony Jack Giacalone, a Detroit mobster, and Teamster boss Anthony Provenzano. When Hoffa did not return home that evening, his wife reported him missing. Both men denied they were supposed to have met with him. Hoffa's body has never been found and the actual cause of his death has never been determined. In 1982, he was declared presumed dead. In 1992, Jack Nicholson starred in a biopic about Hoffa's life. His disappearance has generated considerable interest over the years with multiple theories, and still the mystery remains unsolved. One thing that's not a mystery was his determination to make workers' lives better. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Have you filed to get your $125 from Equifax for what was the biggest data breach ever? Well, until now? Move over Equifax and take out what's in your wallet. Yep, this time a hacker got at 106 million Capital One credit card accounts and applications. Paige Thompson was arrested Monday and charged in connection with the hack. Thompson once worked as a software engineer for the cloud hosting company that Capital One used. Capital One, by the way, says it has fixed the problem, will notify those affected, and will offer victims free credit monitoring. Congress, do your job. Another day, another mass shooting in America. This time it was at the annual Garlic Festival in Gilroy, California, where three people, a six-year-old boy, a 13-year-old girl, and a 25-year-old man, were killed by a teenager with an AK-47 semi-automatic weapon of war who made white supremacist references on social media before he began his killing spree. The shooter was thankfully killed by police about a minute after he began firing on innocent people in the crowd. This time, it's the long-suffering director of national intelligence, Dan Coats, who was shown the cabinet door. Trump's pick for his replacement? Congressman John Ratcliffe of Texas. Who? A virtual unknown who had his big audition for Trump last week at the Mueller hearing. Remember this? So... Americans need to know this as they listen to the Democrats and socialists on the other side of the aisle as they do dramatic readings from this report that volume two of this report was not authorized under the law. Yeah, that guy. Amid some grumbling from Republicans who know little to nothing about Ratcliffe other than his total lack of qualifications for the job, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer labeled Ratcliffe a, quote, partisan shill adding that it would be a grave mistake for the Senate to elevate this partisan warrior to serve as director. It was a disappointing vote in the Senate on Monday where they failed to override vetoes by Donald Trump that would have blocked his arms deal with Saudi Arabia. Just to remind you what this is all about, Congress voted overwhelmingly 
to not approve the administration's deal. The White House, seeking an end run around Congress's power of the purse, invoked an emergency provision in the Arms Export Control Act to bypass the 30-day congressional notification requirement to make the deal. The Republicans showed just how feckless they are, though. The Senate voted on three bills, 45 to 50, 45 to 39, and 46 to 41 on the override attempts, falling short of the 67 votes or two-third majority needed to overturn a veto. Five Republicans did cross over to vote with the Democrats, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, Mike Lee, Jerry Moran of Kansas, and Todd Young of Indiana. And Lindsey Graham actually voted yes on one of those three. Not good enough. Speaking of the Republican-controlled Senate, where House bills go to die, Mitch McConnell is facing a firestorm, not over his blatant obstruction of Democrats' work, but for his apparent Russian leanings. Yep. McConnell came under fire last week when he blocked two attempts by Chuck Schumer and Richard Blumenthal to pass election security legislation by unanimous consent. The nickname Moscow Mitch, coined by MSNBC's Joe Scarborough, began trending. As of 9 a.m. Tuesday morning, Moscow Mitch McTreason was trending on Twitter at number three. As the number of House Democrats joining the call for opening an impeachment inquiry into Donald Trump continues climbing, at last count it was up to around 110, senators are also rapidly joining in, including two of the top Democrats in the caucus, Patty Murray of Washington, number three in Senate leadership, and Debbie Stabenow, number four. Stay tuned. If it's Tuesday, all eyes are on Detroit for the first night of the second Democratic presidential debates, with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren center stage, joined by Pete Buttigieg, Beto O'Rourke, Amy Klobuchar, John Hickenlooper, Tim Ryan, John Delaney, Marianne Williamson, and Steve Bullock. The group Need to Impeach is spending in the mid-six figures to air an ad on CNN and MSNBC before and after the second presidential debates, which again air Tuesday and Wednesday night on CNN live from Detroit. Needless to say, this is prime time for millions of politically active TV viewers. Here's a preview of the ad called What Mueller Said. And what about total exoneration? Did you actually totally exonerate the president? No. Isn't it fair to say that the president's written answers show that he wasn't always being truthful? Generally. You believe that you could charge the president of the United States with obstruction of justice after he left office? Yes. The campaign welcomed the Russian help, did they not? Yes. And then they lied to cover it up? Generally, that's true. Need to impeach is responsible for the content of this advertising. I got the And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler of The Nicole Sandler Show, which is always available to you via podcast at NicoleSandler.com, along with lots of other information. We're also heard on the Progressive Voices Network, and we've moved again. You can now hear The Nicole Sandler Show Tuesday through Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern to Pacific, right here. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 58 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of 89 to 91. We'll see how that goes. Still under an active air quality alert. Uh, Hopefully the cooler temperatures and moister air will help the firefighters putting out these wildfires uh, that are funneling right through my canyon area and finding its way to the Bay Area. Wow. So uh, air quality will not be very good today. Partly cloudy conditions currently with the winds out of the north northwest light and variable will be picking up to their usual clip of 5 to 10 miles per hour out of the northwest uh, 
shifting again tonight out of ever so slightly out of the north northwest at its continuing clip of five to ten miles per hour. Grass pollen is moderate. The air quality index is exceedingly unhealthy at 122 parts per million. Even healthy people better wear a mask. The daytime UV index is very high at 8. Barometric pressure is holding steady currently at 29.81 inches, expecting to go higher a little bit later. Visibility is down to 7 miles, and that relative humidity is at 80%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 68 with a light rain. Paris is 75 and partly cloudy. Rome is 88 and sunny. Kiev is 85 and fair. Kabul is 90 degrees and fair. Tokyo, I'm sorry, Hong Kong, is 80 degrees and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 85 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia, is 50 degrees with a rain shower. San Francisco, California, is 54 degrees, mostly cloudy, with an air quality advisory from our smoke. And New York, New York, is 86 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. Oh, with a wind advisory and a heat advisory. So do take care. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Capital One Financial Corp. said that personal information, including names and addresses of about 100 million individuals in the United States and 6 million people in Canada, were obtained by a hacker who has been arrested. The suspect... A 33-year-old former Seattle technology company software engineer, identified as Paige Thompson, made her initial appearance in U.S. District Court in Seattle yesterday, Monday. According to a complaint filed in the District Court for the Western District of Washington at Seattle, Thompson posted information from her hack, which occurred between the 12th of March and the 17th of July, on coding platform GitHub. Another user saw the post and notified Capital One of the breach. Law enforcement officials were able to track Thompson down as the page she posted on contained her full name as part of its digital address. Capital One said it identified the hack on July 19th. How quick of you. A representative for the U.S. Attorney's Office said it was not immediately clear what the suspect's motive was. Well, maybe she wanted to know what was in people's wallet. The incident is expected to cost between $100 million and $150 million in 2019, mainly because of customer notifications, credit monitoring, and legal support, Capital One said. The hacker did not gain access to credit card account numbers. Ha 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 Do you really expect us to believe that, Capital One? The Capital One hacker was able to gain access to the data through a misconfigured web application firewall. Capital One shares fell 4% in late extended trading now that everybody knows what is in your wallet. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière 
La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est tout Even more anonymous worker bees bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Brazilian President Ya Bolsonaro said there was no evidence. An indigenous chief whose death was decried by the U.S. US Commissioner for Human Rights was killed by wildcat miners said to have invaded protected tribal lands. The far-right Bolsonaro has repeatedly criticized the existence of protected lands, saying there are too many of them and that they prevent Brazil from profiting profiting from its natural resources. Oh, you mean exploiting. The leader of the the Wajapi tribe, who lives on a reservation near Brazil's northwestern border with French Guinea, was found dead last week. The state indigenous affairs agency, headed by Bolsonaro appointee, said the most recent police report on the indigenous leader by the name of Wajapi's death showed no evidence of the presence of an armed group on the reservation at the time. (laughs) <laughs> no evidence at the time. But an internal memo, memo from Funai's office in Amapa State, seen by Reuters, said 10 to 15 armed men had invaded Wajapi land and occupied a village last week. The memo sent on Saturday evening said it was not clear yet how Wajapi died. Well, we can only imagine United States High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet, a former president of Chile, called for an investigation describing Wajapi's death, quote, a disturbing symptom of the growing problem of encroachment on indigenous land, especially forests, by miners, loggers, and farmers in Brazil. It's the Wild West again, folks. In a statement, Bachelet also urged Bolsonaro to reconsider his government's proposal to open up more of the Amazon rainforest to mining. Under Bolsonaro, deforestation of the Amazon has accelerated, according to a state-run agency. Bolsonaro has called the deforestation numbers false. Why not? The Indigenous Missionary Council rights group called on Bolsonaro to defend the constitutional rights of Brazil's native people to their tribal lands. Aggressive hate speeches by Bolsonaro and members of his government are encouraging the invasion and pillage of land and violence against indigenous peoples. The group said in a statement. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on. In fact, we're going to meet up here tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Don't we need it? So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver.
Je voudrais du Fred Astaire Revoir un latte coel Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 